Hello everybody, I'm John Chapman and I'm from Geometrics in Australia and we'll be giving a short talk on other ways of looking for diamond origin ID other than using fluorescence. I wish I was over there in Greece with all of you because I'm sure you're enjoying much better weather than we have here in Perth. A quick recap on the instruments available from Geometrics for looking at fluorescence. Uh, the main one is a jewelry inspector or jewelry PL inspector, which uh, enabled shortwave and longwave viewing of a diamond or other gem for that matter. The instrument would allow for observation, usually through a, a smartphone, of the longwave and shortwave reaction, and the general rule of thumb would be that with a natural diamond, the long wave intensity is greater than that of the short wave. It is through these observations that I've managed to generate a chart which shows, illustrates the reactions that might be observed for different colors and different types of diamond, whether they're natural and treated or CVD or HPHT or in the case of this collection here, also whether they're imitations like moissanite or CZ. But this chart is more of just a guide of some of the reactions. And you'll notice in some instances it's difficult to make a decision because the reaction's behavior might be similar for different types of diamond. For example, in, you can get a yellow diamond which doesn't fluoresce in either short wave or long wave and that would uh, could be either a synthetic HPHT grown one or it could be a variety of natural one and the same applies to blue so we really need another method in addition to this uh, to give us a insight into the origin or whether there have been treatments so to fill this need, uh, Geometrics recently has developed two more instruments, uh, one for looking at birefringence, uh, also known as a cross-polarizing filter arrangement, and uh, that one's known as a strain view, and a slightly more sophisticated piece of kit uh, called an spectrum, which will enable observation and recording of PL spectra and also visible absorption spectra. But first, let's look at the birefringence and what that can tell us. The birefringence or strain within a diamond can be revealed by observing the stone through some cross polars. By having it, the axis of the polarizers orthogonal to each other, no light should get through. It's, it's, uh, the view should be black. But if there's some rotation of the polarization through the stone, then colors can appear, particularly if that polarization, the rotation rather, is a frequency or wavelength dependent, which it is. And here's an example of uh, some colors as seen in a rough diamond in this instance, um, where the strain is commonly exhibited around inclusions. If we consider natural diamonds, the birefringence pattern tends to be looking like a, an oil slick with sort of multiple colors, a rather abstract pattern. But this pattern, if you see that, you can be pretty comfortable that the stone is natural. But if you don't see it, that doesn't mean to say it's not natural. It seems to be traditional to view such uh, birefringence patterns through the pavilion, like with the previous slide. But if the stone is a, a fancy cut and has a sort of flattish pavilion, then light can get through quite successfully without having to look through the side. So here's some e examples of stones while looking directly down on the pavilion. I haven't tried it here or done it, but it, this, these sorts of patterns would be enhanced even more if 
they can the stone can be submerged underwater. One of the attractive things about the technique is it's not limited to near colourless diamonds, that you can also apply it to fancy colours, as seen in these examples of natural diamonds. When looking at CVD, generally speaking, and I use that term generally because it's not always the case, the pattern tends to be what's described as columnar, so sort of lines uh, all, all parallel to one another, which, as it turns out, I think, correspond to the direction of growth of a CVD crystal. And this can be applied to it both colourless and coloured diamonds, there are a couple of pink ones here in this slide. And there are some instances where the pattern could be confused to that of a CVD when in actual fact the stone is natural, particularly when some plastic deformation has taken place with say browns or pinks, which could be quite light in colour. So here are a couple of examples which show patterns which aren't clearly that of, one might not think that of a natural diamond, uh, but they are. Natural type 2s do pose a problem with fluorescence type observations, but with uh, cross polars there tends to be a distinctive pattern of um, what might be called tatami, sort of cross hatching two directions, though the one on the left understandably might look like CVD. On the whole, HPHT grown diamonds are relatively easy to see through cross polars because they have no strain or very little, so there's no coloured patterns. However, sadly, there are instances of natural diamonds also having very weak birefringence and could be mistaken for an HPHT grown one, though keen eyes would see sort of a smudge pattern which shows a very low amount in some instances. So that's just a cautionary tale on some rare instances. One of the problems with the technique is that when the, if a stone is mounted it can be quite difficult to see the pattern. But if the mounting is proud, allowing observation through the pavilion, then it is possible to get a view. Now if you look at the one on the left there, you can see it's hard to know is it natural or HPHT treated. As it turns out, it was natural, but uh, it's not obvious. Whereas the one on the right, it is quite clear that that's a, a natural growth. You'll see from this preceding discussion that there are instances where it's not crystal clear what the origin of the diamond is and we might need to resort to another technique particularly also if one's looking for treatments that might have been applied to a diamond. The inspectrum or spectroscopic techniques is what can enable one to do the somewhat more advanced method of analysis. The spectrum provides two different modes of operation to record or observe spectra. The first is PL, also sometimes known as Raman, which uh, is achieved by shining a laser, usually ultraviolet if you want to look in the visible region, but can be of a higher wavelength like green or red. And effectively one is observing the components of the fluorescent color coming from that illumination. The PL inspector, not PL inspector, the, the Inspectrum uses a 405 nanometer laser and uh, with filters it's able to then look at a range of 410 to 800 nanometers. While the visible absorption is the other mode of operation, just illuminating with white light across the spectrum of interest and that uh, 
can show some features that aren't revealed by PL, which on the whole is a very sensitive technique. You can pick up signals from defects in concentrations as low as one part per million. If we consider PL spectra first, because it's probably the most useful type of spectroscopy when it comes to diamonds, the main feature that a searcher, observer will be looking for is an N3 center, as this is a, a, a sort of fingerprint for natural diamonds. It has a main peak at 415 nanometers, and then it has these other associated peaks sitting on top of a, a broad blue emission, which is that is what you see when you are looking at the fluorescence under UV. For HBHT grown diamonds, the fluorescence, well, the fluorescence is very weak blue, and consequently the PL will also be and it tends to be generally featureless. So low intensity, it is in the sort of bluest band, like you see in the top one here. Um, and there'll be a spike, which is the Raman signal uh, associated with diamond. CVD grown diamonds can be a bit more interesting spectroscopically because depending on how it's grown and the equipment used, there may be a silicon vacancy peak at 737 nanometers and also a nitrogen vacancy one which is in the I've got a zero there because it's in the neutral state again a bit like with the HPHT the intensity can be very low and one way of recognizing that in a plot like this is by comparing it to the height of the Raman peak so the lower graph here, you can see it's a very weak signal because Raman Peak is really quite high compared to it all. But these silicon vacancies are not always there. That depends on the chamber used. It comes from the glass. So the absence of it doesn't mean a stone is not CVD. The nitrogen vacancy peak is not an indicator of CVD on its own as it's possible to see it even in a natural diamond like this example here which shows the N3 center also an H3 which is a vacancy related defect and then the NV which I mentioned in the case of some pink diamonds that owe their color to the nitrogen vacancy center the height of this peak can be quite high Here's one from a Golconda pink, which is a mine in India. They're notionally a type 2 diamond, but you'll see it does have a small amount of N3. And it also has h fill curiously. But the main feature, and that's, result, that's responsible for the orange fluorescence of these stones, is the neutral NV center. The NV center can also be introduced artificially into lab-grown diamonds, either CVD or HPHT, through irradiation, and that will create a, an NV center equally. So here's a PL spectrum of such a stone. You can see the peak at 576 nanometers for the NV center, but there's also another feature, and that's sort of like a reverse peak up in the red 637 and that's uh, due to some absorption that's taking place with that center rather than an emission. If we look at now the absorption spectra of some stones here's that same one and uh, you can see the negatively charged NV center there acting as an absorption. Where an absorption spectra can show a defect that's not revealed by PL, mind it depends on the wavelength, but at 405 nanometer laser, uh, that, that is the 741 nanometer GR1 line that does show up in the absorption spectra 
as seen in this example of a bluish green diamond. But that merely shows that irradiation is the cause of the colour. It doesn't actually tell you on, on the basis of the spectrum alone whether that irradiation is artificial or natural. One of the useful features of the software is if you have a collection of reference spectra or in time it hope to be provided, it's possible to overlay it on the screen and be able to select different ones, turn them on and off through a panel. Sometimes, despite all these instruments at one's disposal, one can be uncertain of the true ID of a, of a diamond. And I show an example in this instance of one that had a bright green fluorescence, a bit unusual. It, uh, under the PL spectrum, well, it didn't show any N3 or any features other than that green emission. The biofringent showed very little, perhaps a, a smudge, so one would wonder if it's an HPHT candidate which had something done to it, or maybe it's not even diamond, but um, it could have been a CZ on the basis of those, might have a pattern like that. The absorption spectrum equally didn't show any features that gave a clear indication of whether the stone was natural or otherwise. Actually, no, the PL spectrum does show that it's a diamond because that's a small Raman peak. And it was only through an infrared spectrum that it was clear that this is a natural diamond because of its high concentrations of nitrogen in both A and B states, and also because of the numerous hydrogen complexes. Some stone can be quite tricky even using those geometric tools at one's disposal, which I've mentioned. Uh, here's one I particularly refer to. It had a green fluorescence, and uh, which is a bit unusual for near colours, although it was a light brown stone. Uh, the PL spectrum did show a small Raman peak, which is comforting, comforting that it shows that it is diamond. The biorefringent showed very little, probably none, and the absorption showed didn't show any recognizable features like an N3 or something which would be nice. So at that stage I was still a bit uncertain as to what the nature of the diamond was and it was only through infrared spectra that uh, it was it could be clearly established that it was natural. But Dimitri doesn't make one of those spectrometers and doesn't intend to but I just show that um, to people as that would lead to what might be known as an advanced instrument. So I hope I've given you just a quick overview of these two two instruments, the strain view and the spectrum. In essence, if I showed that with these extra tests you can get extra confidence in making an assessment of a diamond's identity. But of course both these tests aren't necessarily limited to diamond and they can be used in other gems which also have their signatures. Now I know that first question on many of your mind is well how much are these? Well I don't know which about euros, US dollars or or drachmas or whatever but typically um, strain view is around the $120 mark, US dollar mark and the uh, in spectrum, uh, somewhat below four thousand dollars, euros, something like that. But um, anyway, send me a message or touch base with Branco, and we can provide further information. Anyway, thanks for listening, and um, I hope you found that this is a possibly a useful bit of kit to add to your inventory list of tools. Okay, bye-bye.